So just to catch us up, quick recap, uh, as we've been moving our way through uh, the book of Revelation, after an introduction in chapter 1, chapter 2 and 3, we see the church age, and through this church age time, uh, there's seven letters that are written. Those seven letters speak to seven literal churches in that time, to seven church ages throughout history, through to seven types of churches. It, it's a broad spectrum, and we are still living in this time. This is where we're at today. I believe we're at the end of the church age, but we are in the church age, uh, still moving along through that. The next event to happen is the rapture. That is the next prophetic event that we are waiting for. Nothing has to happen for that to happen. Um, that is what we are waiting for. That's chapter 4, verse 1. He says, come up here. And John is uh, taken up into the heavenlies, which is, a, as I see it, as I've taught it, a picture of the, ra of, uh, the rapture. And um, again, we, we strongly believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, although I will tell you that um, I'm not dogmatic on that, as I've said before, as I study the scriptures. Um, I see possibilities of other options, but today I'm definitely holding to a pre-tribulation rapture understanding of the scriptures. If certain things start taking place, well, I'll change my dogma or my doctrine on that, pardon me. Uh, I'll look at it differently, but today that's what we see. The throne we see from chapter 4, uh, verse 2 to 11. John gets up into the heavenlies and he is just taken back by this throne. And he speaks a lot about the throne, what's around the throne, and the one who sits on the throne. And, and he's just enamored by this picture, and we are just reminded that there is a throne, and one sits on that throne. He is king. He is Lord. He is sovereign, and we can trust him. And so there's this throne. And then in chapter 5, we see the lamb takes the scroll from the right side or the right hand of he who sits on the throne. He's the only one who's worthy. There's, there's no one else that is worthy. Only Jesus is worthy. He, you know, the, the, the strong angel comes out with a loud voice and, and asks the question, who is worthy? And I almost see it as like the strongest angel in heaven declares, I'm not worthy and none of you are worthy. Who is worthy? And, and John starts crying but, but the Lamb steps up as one who had been slain, and, and He alone is worthy. He takes the scroll. And then we see in chapter um, 6 and 7, it's all 6 and 7, we went from 6, 1 to 11, we went through five of the seals. As Jesus takes the scroll, it seems almost immediate. He can't wait to get to business. Immediately He starts undoing these seals so that He can read the scroll, right? And and every time he undoes a seal, something happens on earth. And, and we see the four writers uh, that come out. We see the Antichrist comes on the scene. And he comes first in a peaceful takeover. Right? I, I, I don't think that it's entirely peaceful, but he comes speaking words of peace and, and, and giving some answers to what just took place, the rapture. Right? And he's, I got the answer. Here's the answer. We're all one. You know, and, and, and they didn't believe that. So we need to all come together in one government, one, one system, one monetary system. You know, we need to one religion. We need to all come together. And the world's like, oh, this is great. We can finally have this, the thing we've been fighting for and looking for, right? And then um, this peace is taken away with the second seal, and men start killing men. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later this morning if we get there. And then a famine takes place with the, with the fourth seal. And then death. Like, there's, there's disease. There's uh, the animals turn on us. People continue to kill each other. People are starving. Like, sometimes it's been given to you that that first three and a half years is just all peace. It's not. A lot of crazy stuff happens in that first three and a half years. Um, and we're going to see <laughs> this morning, it really gets crazy. Things really get ramped up. And then with the last, the fifth seal, the outcry of those that had been martyred or were being martyred are, are under the throne and they, they cry out to the Lord, how long? How long till you will avenge us, O Lord? It's just a little, little bit longer. And, 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 and so that's where we left off. Now I would suggest that all of these things are kind of overlapping. Like, you know, it's not like uh, there's a cutoff and the Antichrist is like quiet now. No, he's... Peacefully taking, uh, peacefully taking over this whole time, right? And, and, and then people are 
killing each other. That happens the whole time. And, and, and f- once famine starts taking place, that, that is just continuing on. And, 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 and all of these things move us through pretty close somewhere to the, to the nearing the end of the first three and a half years. So all of these things just ramp up and ramp up and ramp up. And I believe the opening of the sixth seal like, like, t- gets us right there. Like when this starts happening, we're like right there. And, and I, I can't place an exact time. It doesn't give us an exact time. But, but when this one happens, certain things start taking place that tell us we're, we're right there at the end of the first three and a half years. And the next three and a half years are just wrath and judgment being poured out. Like it is insane. And wait till you see what happens here. Uh, Revelation 6.17 says, this is after the sixth seal and before the seventh seal. He says, for the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? So this, this sixth seal gets us right there. Pardon me, my... Wow, throat is really dry. Okay, so let's read a few verses together here. 6.12 through 6.17. And... Um, I don't know if you, any of you look at the note thing I make every week. Do y'all look at that? Yeah. And it's a question mark. I have no idea where we're going to end this morning. Because we're just going to end when I run out of time. Which maybe, maybe two verses. But we're going to read 12 to 17 and see what we can get. <coughs> it says, I looked when he opened the sixth seal. And behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became like blood. The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Now, I did not purposely pick this portion when all the kids were going to be in the room this morning. And I thought about that like, I'm like, wow, maybe I should teach something else. But let me just say this to you kids. We shouldn't be here for this. And if we are, God will protect us by either taking us home or protect us. Don't be afraid of what we're going to see this morning. We're not, none of this is supposed to cause us to walk in fear. He didn't tell, the Lord never tells us something to freak us out, right? The only thing you're supposed to be afraid of is going into eternity without Jesus. That should cause you great fear, right? That idea should stir up fear in you. But, but, but if you have trusted Christ for your salvation, this should not cause fear, okay? This is going to happen. This is definitely going to happen, but I wanted just to make that statement to you kids. You haven't been with us through all of this journey in Revelation. Don't let this cause fear. Let this cause you to recognize the need to tell your friends and your loved ones about Jesus. All right? This is what this should do in your life. Okay, kids? You, you with me? Because some of the stuff is, I mean, if, we're, if we were here, it would be scary. I mean, to see these things happen would be scary, right? Uh, Tell your friends about Jesus. Be motivated with that. So verse 12, part A, the first part of verse 12. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. Now, I don't know about you, but it does seem like more earthquakes are happening today than when I was a kid. Now, I grew up in Southern California. So here in Michigan, you know, earthquakes are always somewhere else, right? You're never like, oh, when's the big one going to happen here? Well, I grew up in an environment where we were always waiting for our state to fall into the ocean, right? That's what we were told was going to happen. Someday, the San Andreas Fault is going to blow all of this into the ocean. And, and then we moved to a house that literally looked at a lake that was caused by the San Andreas Fault. When I realized that, it was after we had already bought the house. And I said, you know what, honey? That lake down there? It's caused by the San Andreas Fault. She's like, well, at least we'll be the first to go. 
You know, it, like we'll just be done, you know. But so earthquakes were something that, and I remember growing up, earthquakes were a big deal. I mean, we were, I was there when the Northridge earthquake happened, and, and I remember it distinctly, you know, things start moving and things start getting all of a sudden, bam, you know. And if, if you've never been in a big earthquake, it is quite uh, hair raising. It, it is definitely something that catches your attention. I've been literally thrown out of bed at 1 a.m. In, in, in the morning by an earthquake and woke up on the ground and things are shaking and something crashes in this room. And, and, and those were small. Those were 6.0s, 6.2s. There was one that happened in Alaska, a famous earthquake. It was like 7.6, 7.9, maybe even around 8. I forget the exact measurements. The ground opened up and houses fell in. I mean, like, it, that's, earthquakes are intense, right? But here the Bible says that there was, and when the Bible uses the word great, there was a great earthquake. One. One earthquake, and I think the whole world is dealing with it, right? It's, it's like the whole earth is being, the foundations are just being rocked, the, the, this, this is like unlike anything that the world has ever seen. One of the things that you do here today, though, with this increasing number of earthquakes is, ah, that's a sign of the end of the days, right? Maybe, maybe, but that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about a earthquake that rocks this world, that rocks everything. Nothing, nothing is not shaking as far as I could. This is just massive, massive uh, a massive earthquake, and, and the idea that, that we're going to see earthquakes coming um, before you know, the end times comes, comes from the Gospels. We see uh, Matthew 24, 7, the nation will rise against nation, the kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places, and you can read in Mark 13, very similar language, Luke 21, 11, very similar language. But if you look at the, the way that Jesus laid these things out, it actually matches the seals, it's like these are all, he was just giving kind of an overview, a recap of what happens when the seals get broken. So I almost think that what Jesus is talking about is actually placed in the time that we've been studying in Revelation and doesn't necessarily speak of things ramping up to the end times. Does that mean that there haven't been more earthquakes? Maybe there has. Or maybe we're just more aware of it through technology, the internet, you know, instant news. You got to remember that we're getting information about things that are happening in places that you never heard about, but might have been happening in places before, right? Just a thought, just to balance it, I don't know, I don't know, but that's not the thing that makes me think we're in the end times specifically. Oh, there's earthquakes. No, there's a lot of things that make me believe we're in the end times, and maybe that's on the list. So, one of the things about um, the scriptures that I kind of had an epiphany in studying this little part right here. An epiphany for me, I'm sure other people have had this thought. It's not a new thought, I'm sure. But when you look at the scriptures, we say what? They're alive, right? It's God-breathed. Now, there is uh, a modern-day narrative that would say, oh, well, um, the scriptures mean something different today to us because we've learned certain things than they did to people back then. And, you know, there's certain topics today that have come up in the church that many in the church are saying, well, we should accept these things and, and, and reinterpret what the scriptures say because of things that we've learned today. Let me just start by saying this. The truth of scripture has never changed, has, has never, ever changed. What was true then is true now, right? And, and so when it comes to actual interpretation it always meant what it meant. Jesus always meant what he meant. The words have always, that's never open for reinterpretation. The, and most of the things that are being negotiated today and, and, and re-looked at, re-analyzed, have come from social changes. Oh, because our society has changed, we now need to look at, the scriptures have never cared what society they've been applied to. The truth has always been the same. Right? So that's just bunk. Right? Oh, science has learned more stuff. So let's, let's look at the scriptures. No, no, no. The scriptures continually debunk science. That's happened over and over and over again. What are you trusting, science or the scriptures? Oh, pastor, you're going to pit yourself against science? Yes. Yes, I am. 
I don't trust the world's view on anything. Anything. I trust what Scripture says. And if Scripture contradicts the world's view on something, guess who's wrong? The world. The world is wrong. And, and, and sometimes, like I said last week, we're going to look crazy. Who cares? As long as God, as long as I'm following what the scriptures say and doing what God wants me to do, I don't care who thinks I'm crazy. Listen, y'all know me well enough, you know I'm crazy, right? So who cares? Who cares? But this, so just to lay all that down to say this, although the truth in the scriptures never changes, our there is some understanding and perception that can change. And, and I do believe that certain scriptures speak louder to certain generations. Would you agree with that? When we're reading Revelation, we're seeing things from a, wow, puzzle pieces have set up. Just the simple fact that Israel is back in the land. For 2,000 years, that hadn't happened. And they started reinterpreting scripture to try to fit what they're seeing around them. And, and lo and behold, what God said, he really meant Israel's back in the land. They just didn't wait long enough, right? And for years and years, they would read Revelation and they would read different things and they would try to say, oh, maybe that's, and think about it, if you were in medieval times, you would see different things and you would try to apply those things to maybe the military might of the day, right? Those things are catapults. For sure, that's a catapult. Well, no, are, you, are we using catapults today? No, we're using missiles, right? And we don't even know some of the technology that they might have. You get what I'm saying? So when I read these passages here in Matthew, and, 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 and I don't apply them to, to, to what's happening so much in my life, I think this is a portion, Matthew 24, 7, 13, 8, where Jesus' words are going to resound to the Jews who are still here after the rapture. These words are going to impact them in a unique way. Not that it doesn't impact me and speak to me now, but are you, are you following with me? Are you tracking with me? It's just the scriptures speak louder to different, to, they do to me in my life. Right? I'm reading through the scriptures and certain times I go through those passages and they're just not, and then I read those passages, man, they're just hammering me at this point in my life. Because it's alive, people. This word is alive. And the Holy Spirit takes it and works deep things in our hearts and in our lives. All right. So moving on. Moving on. The second half of chapter 6, verse 12. And, so this crazy earthquake, everything's shaking, you know? And, and when, when you get down to the end of 6, they say, they go into caves? Maybe there's no house left. I mean, think about that. Maybe the only thing that's left is caves. Everything has fallen. You know, it's just, look around. Okay, there's a cave. You know, I'm going to go in there. I don't know. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. Now, again, over the past few years, we've heard an awful lot about blood moon. The blood moon. Who here heard something about the blood moon? Did it freak you out a little? Maybe some of us got a little concerned. Whoa, what's this about the blood moons? We never had this many blood moons. Oh, guys are writing books about blood moons. They're doing large seminars on blood moons. Listen, the fact that the blood moon lines up with the Jewish calendar is because the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. It's a lunar calendar. Everything the moon does is going to line up with it. That's just, no, no. And this right here, this is not like something that's happened before. This is unique. This is something that's happening right here in history that's crazy. The blood turn, the moon turns to blood. It, it, and it's, it's not just a common occurrence. Oh, this has happened uh, 72 times in the last 2,000 years. By the way, that's about right. It's like 68 times or something there's been a blood moon. Guess what? Always landed on a special day in the Jewish calendar because it's a lunar calendar. 
So that doesn't, that's not a sign. And what people do when they, they make us look foolish because they start, they start telegraphing things out and saying September 23rd. Anybody hear about that one? Did I address it? That's the first time. Because there's nothing to it. Because no man knows the day or the hour. And we're not supposed to be looking for signs in the heavens to tell us when Jesus is coming back. He told us just to be ready. Be ready. Every minute, every hour, every second, be ready. Because you don't know when I'm coming back. You don't know when this thing is going to happen. So don't get tripped up by those things. But this one, if you're here for this one, which I don't think we will be, but if we are, it's going to be unlike anything you've ever seen. It's going to be crazy. The, the moon is going to turn like blood. Now I saw, did, did all you see the, the blood moon? Did any of you see it? I saw it. It, it was slightly tinged red, Right? I mean, it was pretty cool. It's like, wow, that's cool. But I don't think it's this. I think this is like, oh, there is a red moon in the sky. And maybe it's moving, you know, blood. I don't know. What does this mean? And the sun becomes black. Uh, some would say, well, yeah, that's because there was a giant earthquake and all the smoke that goes in. No, I, I, I just don't think that that's how these things, I think it's something supernatural. I think this is really insane. These two great lights and the luminaries, they are given as signs. They are given as signs, but not to the church. These are signs to Israel. And, and that's why these things happening in this time is God speaking to, 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 to Israel, to Jacob. Signs. All of this Looking for signs. Are we in the last days? Listen, we're in the last days for lots of reasons. And, I, and I've shared a lot of those reasons with you for the sake of time. I'm not going to do that this morning. But these aren't the signs we're looking for. D do you know the sign that Jesus told us that we would get? There's one sign he gave to the church. Does anyone know what that sign is? Jesus rose from the dead. We got Matthew 1239, but he answered to them and said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Look, we don't need anything. All we need to do is look for Christ. Like we're supposed to be focused on Jesus. Well, we're going through Revelation and it can get kind of, and I mean, I'm as bad as anyone. I can get pretty uppity about things and pretty excited about things, Right? But I'm just supposed to be looking to Jesus, remembering that he has saved me from my sins, that I have a hope and a future in him, that I know that he only sends good, and that, that even if things are happening that seem very difficult or bad around me, God is good and will carry me through these things and will take me home. I have a future with him. Oh, just, like, just get fixated on that. Right? Just remember those things. I believe that this event is going to be unlike anything this world has seen. Absolutely nuts. And it gets crazier. Are you ready for this? Verse 13. And the stars of heaven fell to earth. And the stars of heaven fell to earth. Well, pastor, that, that's obviously figurative. That is, pastor, that has got to be spiritualized. Why? Why? Why do you believe that? Why do you believe that that has to be spiritualized or figurative? Well, I've been told that. You know what? I looked through every commentary I had, and you know what I kept saying? You wimped out. You're a wuss. You're, you wimped out. What? And then, and then it came my turn. I'm going to come up here and teach. I'm going to teach on something that could be easily just to spiritualize it or make it figurative, and I could wimp out. You know what? 
I have promised you that I will just tell you what the scriptures say. Now, sometimes I'm going to have to leave you to draw the conclusions because I don't have answers for what this exactly means. All right? But I did a lot. I, do, I dove in. Okay, stars. What does that word mean? Stars. And I've told you before that the word star in scriptures can be interchangeable with angel or messenger, right? Like we've seen that before. But guess what? When it's translated star, but means messenger angel, it is a different word that is being used here for star. So although the concept or the word star in our scriptures sometimes means something different than when you look up and you see the stars, okay, it's not the same word that's translated. So I'm like, interesting. Is this anywhere else? Or is this the only place that this happens? Well, two out of the four Gospels say the exact same thing, and guess who said it? Jesus. Jesus tells us, let me just read for you, Mark 13, 24 through 27, but in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Jesus is telling us exactly this sixth seal, right? Sixth seal, same thing. The stars of heaven will fall and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And that's the next thing we see in, Reve in, in this Revelation passage is the, the powers of heaven are shaken. Jesus is telling us exactly what John has seen in Revelation. And he says stars, and guess what? The same word is used here in Matthew as it is in Revelation. I wanted to say these are angels falling. Because that's what I've been taught. And how that works, I don't know. But somehow, people taught me that. And when I went to teach it, I'm like, no. Every single commentary I went said, this symbolizes blah, blah, blah. This is a picture of blah, blah, blah. This is spiritualized, blah, blah, blah. And none of it made sense. I couldn't make sense of any of it. Listen, this word, and I can't pronounce it, I'm sure, well, but the word agelos, A-G-G-E-L-O-S, it's a noun, it means messenger, one sent to announce or proclaim, it's translated angel and star, that is not the word used here. Okay, that's not the word used here. The word used here is A-S-T-E-R, aster, and it, or asteros, it is a noun, and it means star. Take the word, the exact Greek word, put it in Google, and I'm not like the, the written English version, but the actual Greek version, put it in Google, say translate that to English, star. No other word. Okay, let me try it over here, star. All right, let me dig deep, deep into this word, star. Okay, so the stars are going to fall. That's what the scriptures say. Are you feeling challenged? Well, I'm, I'm, my head was spinning. The stars are going to fall. That's, that's crazy, guys. I don't even know. I don't even know. The real argument comes down to this. Are you going to take the scriptures literally and figuratively? If you're going to switch to figurative here, when did that happen and why did that happen? So is the earthquake figurative? Well, no one says the earthquake is figurative. They all say, oh yeah, that's an earthquake. That's what that means. Oh, so then all of a sudden we jump to figurative and the stars are not going to fall to the ground. I, I can't do anything but just tell you what, like anything but me saying what I'm saying here would be me not being true and honest to what the scriptures are saying. The stars fall to the ground. Best I can tell, both John and Jesus are telling us that the stars of heaven are going to come crashing down on us. And, and it gets crazier. It gets crazier. Because look, verse 14 through 17 says, then the sky, okay, the, 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 the moon is blood red, the, the, the sun is blacked out, the stars have fallen to, from heaven have fallen to the earth, and then the sky, is, it, it's receded, it's like rolled up like a scroll. The sky just gets rolled up. 
and every mountain and every island is moved from its place. When this happens, another shock wave is sent. This one isn't called an earthquake. And I think whatever is taking place in the heavens sends a, a shock wave. A, something moves. The, the atmosphere has changed. Something and everything's just like, bam! Is it going to get crazy? Is this stuff not nuts? It's nuts. It's insane. What should this be doing in our hearts? Motivating us to tell people about Jesus. They can escape this. He's got an escape plan. He, he did all the legwork. He rose from the dead. He proved he is God. Trust him. Trust Jesus. This is coming. This stuff is real. This is coming. And I don't care if I sound like a madman saying it. This is what the Bible says. And I won't make excuses for it. And how do I know? So what do I think happens here, guys? I think the spiritual veil is rolled back. I think whatever is keeping us from seeing that throne, which is above us, whatever is keeping us from seeing the Lamb with the scroll, I think if you looked up right now, you're almost seeing a mirror. Well, what do we see in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 12? For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. I think, I think there's, there's a spiritual or some, some mirror keeping us from seeing the reality that is right there. It's right there. And, and why would I say that? Because look what happens after this thing is just rolled back. This thing is removed. This curtain is pulled back. And the kings of the earth and the great men and all of these people, what do they say? Hide us from his face. What? Have you ever recognized what happened here? They can see the throne. They can see the Lamb. My take here, guys... My take is that, for, in, my, in my opinion, the next three and a half years, all you have to do is look up and see a throne. It's radical. Would that not transform the way that you see the next three and a half years in Revelation? Now, I told you, I'm not dogmatic on this. This, this some of the stuff. Am I positive that they can see the throne the next three and a half years? Well, I'm not. But it seems that's what it's saying. Why would they cry that out? They, they literally hide us from his face. They had no concern or care for God. They, they, they weren't even willing to admit he was there. And all of a sudden, they're trying to hide from him. It's like, it's like um, mice in a in a Petri dish, the light gets turned on and the guy's looking down and oh, and they scramble or maybe more like cockroaches, I guess. Yeah, I just called everybody <laughs> in that time cockroaches. That's not very nice. Guys, on this day, on this day, the whole thing gets blown wide open. The whole thing gets blown wide open. And here's the crazy part. Here's the mind-blowing, if what I'm saying is indeed what this is saying, which I challenge you, go study it. I did. And, and, I, and I felt like I could come up here and dance around and try to spiritualize this stuff and not just say plainly what it's saying, or I could man up and just tell you what it says. Right? Right? I promised you, when I took this pastorate, I promised you from this pulpit that I will just teach you what the scriptures say. And, and sometimes that means I gotta come up and say, hey, you know what the Bible says? The stars are all gonna fall on us. Yeah, but how can that be, pastor? I have no idea. Maybe we need to rethink what those things are. Are you saying? I'm saying I trust the Bible more than I trust science. I'm saying I trust the Bible more than I trust the, the narrative given to us by men. I'm saying whatever the scripture says, I'm going to bank on that. 
And whether it is, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Super crazy thought. The stars are going to fall. The sky is going to recede like a scroll. And we're going to see the, th well, hopefully we're up there looking down. Think about that. Hi. No, seriously. Like if we're standing up there and that's all, and we're like, yep, they can see us now. They aren't going to pay any attention to us. I'll tell you what, the throne and the lamb, that's what they're going to see. <laughs> you and I are going to fade into the nothing there. It is Jesus and the Father. And they're like scrambling like cockroaches when the light turns on. That's literally what's happening here. The whole thing is blown wide open and they are absolutely terrified. But the crazy thing is they don't repent. They continue forward with their plan to take over. That's insane. Like, get your mind around that. You wonder why some people will not receive Christ today. You talk to them about it. And think about this. What are you asking somebody to do? Believe. Believe. Believe that Jesus rose from the dead for your sins. Admit that you're a sinner. Accept that fact and believe that he paid it all for you. You don't have, that's it. Like, believe. Trust him. He'll save you. He'll give you a hope and a future. And they go, no, nah, I don't want that. I'd rather just live in my shame and misery. Thank you. No, 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 but listen, you can be absolved of all of your sin. You can be free. You can be forgiven. You can know that you are loved by God. He will, he will receive you into his family. He will adopt you. He will take you home. You can talk to him openly. Nah, I'm not interested. Thanks. What's wrong with you? Why wouldn't you want that? Have I not said it right? Let me say it again, you know? Let me, let me tell you it in a different way. Nah, I'd rather just keep sinning. Thank you. And here, you go, how could they be this way? Okay, let's roll back the sky. <laughs> let's, let's open the curtain. Here's the throne. Here's the lamb. Nah, I'm going to hide myself. I'm not interested. I do believe that this carries us into the second. Like, this is where we're like right at the doorstep, you know? Because he says, for the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? They say that, yet they don't repent. You would think that at this point, here's where the rest of the story would be. And everybody in the world repented and received Christ. Amen. Close the book. Right? Like everyone that's left goes, oh, there's a throne and he's sitting on it. And there's the lamb. Yep, I believe. I'm in. Count me in. It's not the story, is it? No, they continue to rebel until one day there's a massive army thinking in idiocy that they're going to do something. And one word from the lamb and they're gone. One word. I don't know about you, but this kind of just blew my mind. And I was not expecting that. When I, when I went into this, I'm like, I, I don't know. It's not the message I was thinking I would preach. But it's the only message I could preach. And, and I'll just say this. If you have questions about, I said this last week, questions about anything that I've brought up here, you want to talk it through, my door is always open. Challenge me, okay? Don't just believe me. Go and search the scriptures. Go and study the words. Go to blueletterbible.com and look, go Google this. Study, the, study it. Do it. Don't ever just take any guy's word. Go to the scriptures. Let them speak. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. All right? And if you come up with something different, come talk to me about it. Like, no, seriously. But when I studied it, I'm not spiritualizing these things because there's no warrant for that. The only warrant for that is the same warrant that would say, you know, the seven-day creation is not literal. You got to work evolution into that. Right? You have to make sure because we know evolution is true, so you've got to work that in. So then you start changing what that says. Let me just challenge you that the only reason you have a problem with what this says literally is some of the things you believe. Which are you going to question? Which are you going to question? Scriptures? Or what you believe? Are you feeling challenged? 
The end of this, the end of this is simple. There is one who sits on the throne and there is the lamb who is slain for our sins. Don't go talk to people about the, I mean, you could if you get in a conversation, but that's, we're here to preach the gospel, right? This is a family conversation. <laughs> this is like what we know is gonna happen, okay? But we go out and we share Jesus. We share his love. We share forgiveness of sins. We share the opportunity to know that they are saved. That's what we go out and preach. That's what we go out and talk about. Amen?